wandering across three continents, they spearheaded the German Blitzkrieg, possessing the distinct rumble and using tactics the world had never seen before. These war machines struck fear into the hearts of their enemies, an elite fighting force that nearly conquered the world. Now, Panzers, next on Modern Marvels. As the war began, Hitler's armored spearhead crushed all enemy resistance with massive combined assaults. Panzer tanks devoured territory as Panzer grenadiers moved in and secured the newly won ground. Treads of the Panzers crossed the countryside from Norway to North Africa, from the English Channel to the steppes of Russia. Hitler's general, like Heinz Guderian, the architect of Blitzkrieg, became national heroes. The youth of Germany yearned to be part of the Panzers. For me, there was no doubt in my mind I wanted to be a tank officer. It's very hard to explain, but uh, I think there are many factors uh, to success. Uh, a certain glamour, uh, as a spirit of the tank corps, uh, fascinated me. Maybe it's a uniform, I don't know, I mean, it's hard to remember exactly, but for me there was no doubt in my mind I wanted to be a tank officer. And I was a tank, I became finally a tank officer. But Wolfgang Stirner's first taste of combat came during the Panzer's most difficult fight. In 1943, in the heat of the Russian summer, Two million men and thousands of tanks faced off at Kursk for the greatest tank battle in history. At that time, when I reached the battlefield, of course there was, there was no room for any romantic or other dreams or whatsoever. The reality kept us fully occupied more than that. Of course, I was still very young at that time, over 17 years of age. And then to be in the command of a tank, uh, that really uh, took my entire effort I, I had to, to bring in those days. Was, uh, we fought until the almost complete exhaustion. For three, four days in a row, you went back only in order to fuel up ammunition, a short sleep, and on you had to go again because we had tremendous losses at the time. It was hot. It was uh, very dusty. This was a fighting on point blank range because uh, due to the dust and due to the extreme mass of tanks, we. We could recognize each other only on the shortest distance and then fire a little kind of rough going, I would say. The failure at Kursk started the long retreat for the Panzers. Germany greatly underestimated the capabilities of their opponents and overestimated their own ability to maintain the blistering pace of Blitzkrieg. As the first tanks lumbered across no man's land in World War I, it must have been hard to foresee lightning war as the future for this new weapon. These few tanks spread over the battlefield, plodded along at a walking pace, like a bunker on tracks to shield the infantry from machine gun fire. The lone exception came in November of 1917 at the Battle of Cambrai. The British massed 400 tanks in the first concentrated armored assault. The British tank offensive at Cambrai was successful in penetrating the German lines, but due to the lack of supporting infantry and artillery, the attack eventually petered out. The Germans were able to reform their lines in front of the British advance. And this is one of the reasons that the German army did not really consider the tank to be an important weapon. 
A German army fielded only one type of tank during the First World War. The ponderous A-7V, a 30-ton dinosaur with a crew of 18, struggled over the countryside at a top speed of less than five miles an hour. By war's end, Germany had built about 20 of these giant tanks. The Germans, of course, had been defeated. They were demoralized. The Treaty of Versailles limited them to an army of 100,000 men with no tanks and no combat aircraft. Germany then was faced with the prospect of having to defend itself with minimal resources. Their leaders had to come up with a way to mobilize the troops so that fewer men could do the job of a much larger conventional army. General Heinz Guderian studied British and French theories of armored warfare, radical new theories that prophesied victory with high-speed tanks and mechanized infantry assaults supported by artillery and air power. While the Allied armies all but ignored the ideas, Guderian tested and refined these new theories with an arsenal of dummy wooden tanks and created the blueprint for Blitzkrieg. In the beginning of the war, I was under his command. The General Oberst Guderian, he uh, was called as a father of the uh, tank units, of the tank units. And his idea was to take all the tanks together, followed by armored infantry, followed by artillery, especially self-propelled, and all the other units must have the same speed in the field as the tank units. But old school German leaders viewed Guderian as a renegade. They firmly held on to the notion that tanks should be dispersed across a battlefront and operate only in support of the infantry. And Guderian said, no, the tanks must, ca must come together and must attack all together. In 1933, a demonstration by Guderian and his small tank force settled the argument. Adolf Hitler, Germany's newly elected chancellor, saw enormous potential and proclaimed, this is what I want, this is what I will have. And the panzer divisions were born. German industry secretly geared up to produce the weapons that would put the teeth in the new tactics. Tanks were called Traktoren to disguise their identity. The first tank to roll off the assembly line was the Panzerkampfwagen 1. With a crew of two and two machine guns, the tank was simple and inexpensive. Although armed, this first Panzer was intended only for training. In 1935, the army received the more heavily armed Panzerkampfwagen II. With a 20 millimeter gun and crew of three, this Panzer gave the army a greater offensive punch. On April 20th, 1938, for Hitler's 50th birthday, the Panzer divisions proudly displayed their new weapons of war. We were very proud of having these new tactics, and we were very proud of having Guderian. We were also proud of having good tanks, and most of all, we were very proud of being well trained for this new kind of armored warfare. In three months of 1940, Germany invaded and conquered five countries. All of the existing Panzer divisions were involved in the invasion and were instrumental in the German victory. Panzers will return in a moment on Modern Marvels. We now return to Modern Marvels. At daybreak on September 1st, 1939, Guderian's idea of Blitzkrieg was no longer just a theory. Six panzer divisions, more than 3,000 tanks, exploded into Poland, while overhead, the Luftwaffe Stukas pounded airfields and supply lines.
The Polish army put up a tenacious defense, but their obsolete equipment and tactics offered little hope of holding back the Panzer steel tide. On September 27th, Poland surrendered to the Germans. The Panzers that paraded before Hitler a few months earlier now marched in victory through the first country to fall beneath the Blitzkrieg. Like a brilliant dress rehearsal, the campaign in Poland prepared the German army for the invasion of France. When uh, the Germans invaded uh, France and the Low Countries on May 10, 1940, uh, the Germans had fewer tanks, about 2,700, compared to more than 3,000 French tanks and several hundred British tanks. And further, the uh, French tanks were superior in quality, but they were inappropriately dispersed throughout the country. Every division, every unit had some tanks assigned to it that were not located in mass. The Germans, on the other hand, had concentrated their effort in a uh, front less than 200 miles wide at its widest part, and in there they had concentrated their armor. The tactic was a concentrated tactic of concentrating our tanks followed by the infantry. In the beginning, it was so successful because of the overwhelming force we could muster in a surprise attack. In France, we became aware of just how superior our tactics were. I remember during the attack, looking out of my tank and seeing tanks everywhere, in front of me and behind me. It was this massing that was the reason for our success. Within 24 hours, we crossed three borders. We went from Germany to Luxembourg, from Luxembourg to Belgium, from Belgium to France. And uh, we had the, the French as opponents, and they were so stunned about our appearance that they didn't make any resistance whatsoever. The annihilation of France, like Poland, was not a victory of superior hardware, but a victory of superior tactics. Hitler had pushed his army into war before they were fully equipped. The attacks were led by the lightly armed training tanks, the Panzer I's and II's. The Germans filled in the strength of the Panzer divisions with tanks captured in the occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1938. German industry was not able to supply the numbers of vehicles and weapons required. And as a result, you can make a very good case that Hitler could not have gone into Poland or France or even Russia later in 1941 if he had not had the output of the excellent Czech armament industry. Production had begun on heavier main battle tanks, Panzer III's and IV's, but they were still in short supply during the attacks on Poland and France. The Panzer III was designed as the primary breakthrough tank. Unlike most tanks that are more heavily armored up front, the Mark III was equally armored on all sides. It was expected that initially these tanks would overrun the enemy's frontline defenses and might be vulnerable to anti-tank fire from the rear. The Panzer IV was more heavily armored in front as it was designed to travel with infantry support. The tank was fitted with a 75 millimeter howitzer to knock out enemy fortifications and machine gun nests. The Panzer IV became the backbone of the Panzer divisions. It was not primarily intended as an anti-tank weapon, and indeed during the invasion of France and later Russia, early Panzer IVs with the short howitzer were almost completely incapable of knocking out enemy tanks. The Panzers were propelled to victory by decisive leadership and effective command and control. The armor visionaries like Guderian felt that it was essential to lead armored units from the front because of the speed of their movement and the fact that they often would encounter unexpected obstacles. Leadership on the spot, unhindered by long lines of communication, was essential to seize the initiative. Panzer tank commanders were trained to think and act independently on the battlefield. The great difference between us and other armies was that we were not given specific orders. We were given mission orders. 
If we were given the order to attack a village, I could decide when and where to do it. It was my decision how I accomplished this mission. The difference was that I could react to constantly changing conditions on the battlefield as long as I achieved my goal. A network of sophisticated communication lines helped coordinate the combined arms attacks. In a tank division, we had a liaison officer from the Air Force. And this liaison officer gave the pilots exactly where are the targets. It was absolutely a, rev a revolution in the, in the beginning of the, of the war on our side. While their opponents communicated with archaic hand signals and flags, the Panzers were fitted with state-of-the-art FM radio gear. Our tanks was equipped with uh, communication uh, lines. And we can talk from one tank to another. The platoon commander can talk to all tanks, and the company commander can do it also. But the leading of the tanks was very simple. We used to have uh, certain codes we applied and which we changed, if possible, from day to day. I can remember one word, uh, it was enemy infantry, was the word Prediger Ölsardin. Now that means preacher and uh, sardines. So, I mean, it, it is just one thing I remember. But uh, radio connection was absolutely a must and very important. Over the radio, we can talk all together in the tank. The crew commander to the driver, the driver to the, to the operator, the operator to the loader, and to the signalman. And the communication was excellent, giving by, not, not this microphone, but living here. It was excellent. Ingenious throat microphones didn't transmit the deafening tank noise and helped create an efficiency within the crew unmatched by opposing armies. In February of 1941, Erwin Rommel, a hero of the Battle of France, was dispatched to North Africa to aid the faltering Italian campaign against the British. Rommel's daring tactics redefined the concepts of Blitzkrieg. He regarded the tank as the raiding weapon supreme. He was able to develop tactics that used small groups of, of tanks and other arms that would penetrate deep into the re enemy's rear, get behind the lines, turning up where he was least expected. And he did this by personal example, leading either with the tanks themselves or flying over them in a, in a light aircraft, but always up there, pushing, chivying, much the same as way as Guderian had done in 1939-40, but Rommel carried it to a greater extreme, and he wanted to be there to keep behind it, keep the momentum going all the time. He was a raider. And Rommel is unser selbstverständlich für ein Afrika Mann. Rommel was our idol for all of us who served in Africa. But we would have preferred if he wasn't always so far out in front. We were always worried about his safety. Von der Front rückwärts sich aufgehalten hätte. Rommel, the desert fox, consistently outmaneuvered his adversaries using fewer tanks and men. Rommel was particularly good at using his tanks as a screening force to draw out the British into range where he could then fight with what was his major anti-tank weapon, and that is the dual-purpose 88mm gun. The 88 was, in North Africa, practically a wonder weapon. It was able to knock out any Allied tank at a range of 2,000 yards or better. Operating across the open desert like ships at sea, Rommel and the Africa Corps drove the British back into Egypt in less than a month. Rommel's leadership gave his troops a sense of invincibility, a feeling that would prove to be short-lived. In the beginning, I had no fear because I had not felt any pain. Uh, I had not been wounded, not burned. Um, fear came a little bit later. In 1998, Daimler-Benz, the largest manufacturer of the German Panzer, merged with longtime rival Chrysler, maker of the Sherman tank, in the biggest industrial marriage ever. The new company is the fifth largest automaker in the world. 
Modern Marvels will return in a moment. We now return to Modern Marvels. The Germans struck so quickly with such massive forces that they completely overwhelmed the initial Russian defenses, even though those defenses were extensive. The Russians had over 20,000 tanks on the western frontier, a couple of million troops, thousands of aircraft, and yet within six months, the overwhelming majority of this force had been captured or destroyed. Overconfident from their early victories, the German army was slow to upgrade their tanks. Their intelligence had failed to warn them of the deadly Russian T-34 tank. Our infantry and our soldiers, it was shocking because they cannot do anything against this T-34. Because it was a very, very simple but a strong tank. A simple, decent engine. Uh, no comfort inside the tank, but a very, very big and excellent gun. On the 12th of July, I saw the first T-34 in taking our regiment. It was three tanks, three 34 tanks. And our guns was not strong enough to kill the T-34. So that the, the first 34 was killed running against another. And the, the crew commander from our tanks, he jumped over and put a hand grenade into the Russian tank. It was quite a surprise for us that it could kill us from over 1,000 meters. So we had to find a way to knock it out. We'd hide behind a hill and wait for it to get really close. And then we'd shoot at it from the side. It usually took three to four of our tanks to knock out one T-34. The big disadvantages they had were they had no radio communications and they had no tank commander. Their gunner would have to look out the top of the tank, assess the situation, then duck back down inside the turret to fire. This gave us time to get close enough to knock him out. By late November, the Panzers pushed to within 19 miles of Moscow. But this was destined to be the limit of the German advance. The invasion force had outrun their supply lines and were soon to face an opponent more lethal than the high-velocity gun of the T-34, the brutal Russian winter. We had started a two-front war and we had made no preparations for this winter. No preparations for our clothing, for our weapons, or for our engines. The cold made it incredibly difficult. It got down to 35 degrees below zero with snowstorms. We had to keep the engines running all night to keep them from freezing. There wasn't any heating in the tanks, so the entire inside of the tank would be covered with ice, just from our breath. All the pipes in our in our tank f uh, frozen, and um, we got no um, uh, no fuel, no ammunition, no men, and um, the men were without uh, um, coats and and winter clothing. It was horrible, you know. There were few hospitals in the front. Everybody had the absolute will to stay healthy because if you were wounded it was more or less a death um, sentence in december the russians launched a counteroffensive with troops well prepared for the frigid climate on the frozen steppes of russia the panzers endured their first defeat Staggered by the losses, the Germans scrambled to regain their superiority. Tanks were fitted with thicker armor, and the Panzer IV was upgraded with a long-barreled 75-millimeter gun. In September of 1942, 
the new Tiger tank was rushed from the factory to join the beleaguered Panzer Division on the Eastern Front. The Tiger I was originally developed from the concept of the breakthrough tank to make it so powerful and so well protected that no Allied tank would have a hope of destroying it. This immense tank was fitted with the deadliest gun in the world, the infamous 88 millimeter. With the Panzer 3 and 4, we could start the firefight from only about 400 to 1,000 meters. Now, with the 88 millimeter gun and the Tiger 1, we could destroy any enemy from about 1,800 to 2,000 meters. We could now go into battle with a great feeling of confidence and superiority. I remember at the end of 1942 on the Northern Front, I was in the Tiger and I was faced with 30 enemy tanks. I was able to knock out 15 of them without being hit. There was one big problem. At 60 tons, we were always in danger of sinking into the mud. And at the Northern Front, there was a lot of wet and muddy terrain. It was hardly possible to find a bridge that we could cross unless the engineers were to fortify them in advance. Initially, the Tiger was unreliable and difficult to maintain. Even after these problems were resolved, German industry could never meet the Panzer Division's demand for the weapon. Only 1,350 Tigers were produced. The fact was, it was never a battle one-on-one. -on -one. It was always one against five one against ten. It was common for a Tiger to be facing 12 enemy tanks. I can remember when we were pulling back from Leningrad and there were three Tigers. We destroyed 52 Russian tanks, but they still had more tanks coming at us. The Russian T-34 was equipped with unusually broad tracks and was better suited to the harsh Russian winter than the Panzers. Modern marvels will return in a moment. We now return to Modern Marvels. Hitler had anticipated the Soviet people would crumble under the onslaught. But their resistance only stiffened. Hitler launched ill-conceived offensives in Leningrad and Stalingrad. The armored force was desperately drained of equipment and men. In the summer of 1943, the Germans regrouped. Hitler massed his forces for Operation Citadel and advanced against a salient that had developed in the Russian lines near Kursk. Hitler had delayed the attack until his new Panther tank had reached the battlefield. By contrast with the Tiger, the Panther was a much lighter, much more balanced vehicle. It was well armoured. It was the German equivalent of the T-34. In fact, the T-34 in many ways influenced the design concepts that they, they grew into the Panther. Like the Russian tank, it was designed with sloped armour, an innovation that better protected the crew. The firepower of the Panther's high-velocity 75mm gun was even more lethal than the Tiger's 88. From 1943 onwards, it was the one tank that most of the Russian and Allied tank crews really feared, far more than the, the Tiger. The Panther, far... the Panther yeah. was a real present for us tank soldiers. It had a much better protection and a much stronger gun. Now we could engage the enemy at well over 1,000 meters. With the arrival of the Panther, Hitler was ready for the assault. However, Russian intelligence discovered the plan, and the Soviets braced for the attack. With the help of civilians, they dug 3,000 miles of trenches and buried 400,000 landmines. Along their defensive front, they placed more than 400 artillery guns and mortars per mile. Guderian pleaded with the Fuhrer to reconsider his plan, 
Such an attack would negate all the advantages of Blitzkrieg. There would be no mobility, no surprise. The men of the Panzer Corps would not be the highly trained elite force that entered Poland and France. We had through the outfall from Later in the war, those who replaced the casualties became younger and younger. They didn't have any experience, so the old staff sergeants took them aside and said, Now, my boy, listen. You follow our advice, we'll tell you what to do, and if you don't listen, you'll be dead tomorrow. July 4th, the battle began. 2,700 German tanks squaring off against 3,600 Soviet tanks. This was my first battle, and the first battle for the Panther. It was a murderous fight. Over one million Russian soldiers and 700,000 German soldiers. I remember during the battle we thought, now this is the end of the world. Like the Tiger, the early Panthers experienced numerous mechanical problems. During the first days, it became clear that the engines were not strong enough and could not stand the strain. And there were problems with the transmission. The first breakdowns came during our march to the assembly area. We tried to repair them as quickly as possible and sent them back to the front. And in the first couple of days, it looked like the Germans had some success, but eventually they simply ground themselves to pieces on the Russian defenses. And when it was over, uh, the German panzer forces were emasculated. They were no longer able to uh, conduct warfare as they conducted it in the past. In 50 days of fighting, the Germans lost over 500,000 men and seven complete panzer divisions. The panzers were forced into a long retreat and a brutal battle of attrition. The Luftwaffe had lost air superiority, leaving the tanks easy prey for the Aleutian Sturmovik ground attack aircraft. For me, the worst thing was if we were under air attack. Now, if you are in a tank and they attack you, uh, then you are completely helpless. We feel like uh, like a, a decoy there. Like a tr if 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 the uh, the fighter planes are above you and you have nothing to fight them, uh, and you know it's only a matter of time before they get you, then uh, the feeling is lousy, so to speak. The day that Adolf Hitler sent his tanks across the Russian borders, the day that he lost World War II, there was no way that the Germans could occupy the Soviet Union. The fact was that the Soviet Union was a nation of over 140 million people, whereas Germany had only 50 million. And in a war of attrition, the larger nation was likely to prevail. In North Africa, the German forces were also feeling the crushing effect of the two-front war. Fuel and supplies ran perilously short, and air support was virtually non-existent. When I was there, we had to make the best of everything. Very, very few tanks, long lines stretched out to be protected by just a few. We didn't have enough ammunition. We didn't have enough gasoline. We were also afraid that uh, there was sabotage. I remember that I put a finger in the jerry can, you know, sniffing whether there was any water mixed in it because uh, we feared sabotage. I remember sometimes we went into battle and uh, were not gassed up fully. So we just uh, hoped it would be sufficient, you know. The Allies had broken the German secret radio codes so they could intercept and sink supply ships before they reached port. Rommel was continually forced to scrounge fuel where he could find it, to use captured equipment. Uh, in May of 1943, when the final German units in, in Africa surrendered, almost 85% of their motorized transport were, consisted of Allied vehicles. 
Uh, the last tanks the Germans had basically ran out of fuel and had to be destroyed. The time was over for Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is something that happened in Poland and in France. In Africa, at the end, uh, there was certainly no Blitzkrieg. During the Battle of France, the 7th Panzer Division earned the nickname Ghost Division because no one knew where it was, including the German High Command. Panzers will return in a moment on Modern Marvels. We now return to Modern Marvels. When the Allies invaded Europe in 1944, their main battle tank was the M4 Sherman. The Sherman was rugged, reliable, highly maneuverable, and simple to maintain. However, the Sherman was thinly armored, and its gun was incapable of knocking out the German Panther and Tiger. We could kill the Sherman at a much greater distance than they could kill us. Their gun was not as powerful as ours, and it was obvious in a shootout we could get a lot more of them than they could get of us. One hit on the Sherman, and it caught fire right away. We called the Sherman's Ronsons after the firelighter, because mostly with the first round, they blew up. The Sherman always went up, stood in flames with the first round. The Allies had to devise creative ways to cope with the German technology. Captured German tanks were shipped to the U.S. Army's Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. German tanks are brought here to Aberdeen and they are tested. They're tested in a lot of different ways. They, they test them automotively. They drive them across a thing called the wash rack. Uh, they drive them up and down hills to see what kind of grade they can climb. They drive them up against obstacles. Uh, to see how much of a vertical clearance they can take. They fire round after round into them to see where the weak points are in the armor are. And after a while, a picture emerges of just how effective these things are. And that intelligence information is disseminated to the field. For instance, the early Panther has the gas tanks located aft and they are exposed. And if you know where the gas tanks are, you want to aim for the gas tanks because you're not going to penetrate the frontal armor with a, with a 75 gun on the Sherman. But knowing where the gas tank is, you can aim for that position and kill the tank. The Germans knew that we were doing this type of testing. Uh, they were doing the same thing to our stuff. This is a common everyday practice in, in war. In December 1944, the Germans launched their last full-scale panzer offensive at the Battle of the Bulge. Now, late in the war, they fought with some of the most innovative weapons in the history of warfare. The fight marked the debut of the King Tiger tank. The King Tiger was the heaviest tank ever to appear on any battlefield. It was a real massive brute, 68 odd tons, an 88 millimeter gun, uh, really thick armor to most Allied tanks. If a, if a King Tiger appeared on the battlefield, you found an excuse and left. But they, they suffered the same tactical drawback as the original Tiger did. They were very, very slow. They were so slow and cumbersome. To actually move them, even on a battlefield, was a major operation. But the Germans could never produce their weapons in the quantities necessary to hold off the Allies. In Germany, Production of tanks and other heavy military vehicles was turned over primarily to heavy equipment manufacturers who were used to building heavy trucks, railroad locomotives, and dockyard cranes in fairly limited numbers so that they didn't develop a good idea of the mass production that was possible. In the United States, production of military weapons was turned over primarily to the major automotive manufacturers who were used to building tens of thousands of vehicles in a short period of time. The Germans built approximately 5,500 Panther tanks, and the Americans built 52,000 Shermans. You had two great advantages. You had uh, the greater number, 
and uh, the greater reliability. Our tanks broke down every 100 kilometers and couldn't be repaired. And uh, your tanks, like a clockwork, went on for the whole issue. The Germans were really overwhelmed by such a volume of equipment that it's really hard to fathom how, in many cases, they held on as long as they did with as little as they had. Despite the overwhelming odds, the tank crews never lost the spirit that forged the power of the Panzers. One of the reasons for the German soldier's incredible fighting effectiveness was that even when the chips were down, he kept fighting long after the point when perhaps it was even uh, hopeless to continue. This may be a German characteristic, but we swore at the beginning of our duty to defend our fatherland. And that's how we fought, over and over again. I was wounded four times in the tank. You can see a souvenir from Egypt in my face. We as a junk soldier, we learn to live inside the tank. The problem is only if you are in the field and an and, uh, anti-tank gun hit your tanks. What happened inside the tank? What happened inside the tank? It start a big fire inside the tank. A lot of dust inside the tank. And later it's absolutely quiet. And you will, will ask the crew, Willem, are you living? Charles, are you living? And so on. I uh, lost the tank in five times. And I lost one soldier, it was died in the five times. All the others are only wounded. Myself lost one eye and all the others go in, in my head because the crew commander looks up at the tank with his head. We were young and didn't think much about danger, but the worst would certainly have been if the tank caught fire and we couldn't get out. The crew was very dependent on each other. If there was a hit on the tank, it affected all of us. Anything else you would like to add? Möchten Sie noch etwas hinzufügen? Wir haben so viel Schreckliches erlebt. Es darf keinen Krieg geben. We have experienced so many terrible things. There should never be a war again. Would you believe that the Romans had... I don't know, I mean, it's hard to remember exactly, but for me there was no doubt in my mind I wanted to be a tank officer. And I was a tank, I became finally a tank officer. But Wolfgang Stirner's first taste of combat came during the Panzer's most difficult fight. In 1943, in the heat of the Russian summer, two million men and thousands of tanks faced off at Kursk for the greatest tank battle in history. At that time, when I reached the battlefield, of course, there were, there were no room for any romantic or other dreams or whatsoever. The reality kept us fully occupied, more than that. Of course, I was still very young at that time, over 17 years of age. And then to be in the command of a tank, uh, that really uh, took my entire effort I, I had to, to bring in those days. Was uh, we fought until the almost complete exhaustion. For three, four days in a row, you went back only in order to fuel up ammunition, a short sleep, and on you had to go again because we had tremendous losses at the time. It was hot, 
It was uh, very dusty. This was a fighting on point blank range because uh, due to the dust and due to the extreme mass of tanks, we, we could recognize each other only on a shortest distance and then fire. A little kind of rough going, I would say. The failure at Kursk started the long retreat for the Panzers. Germany greatly underestimated the capabilities of their opponents and overestimated their own ability to maintain the blistering pace of Blitzkrieg. Thundering across three continents, they spearheaded the German Blitzkrieg, possessing the distinct rumble and using tactics the world had never seen before. These war machines struck fear into the hearts of their enemies, an elite fighting force that nearly conquered the world. Now, Panzers, next on Modern Marvels. As the war began, Hitler's armored spearhead crushed all enemy resistance with massive combined assaults. Panzer tanks devoured territory as Panzer grenadiers moved in and secured the newly won ground. Threads of the Panzers crossed the countryside from Norway to North Africa, from the English Channel to the steppes of Russia. Hitler's general, like Heinz Guderian, the architect of Blitzkrieg, became national heroes. The youth of Germany yearned to be part of the Panzers. For me, there was no doubt in my mind I wanted to be a tank officer. It's very hard to explain, but uh, I think there are many factors uh, to success. Uh, a certain glamour, uh, as a spirit of the tank corps, uh, fascinated me. As the first tanks lumbered across no man's land in World War I, it must have been hard to foresee lightning war as the future for this new weapon. These few tanks spread over the battlefield, plodded along at a walking pace, like a bunker on tracks to shield the infantry from machine gun fire. The lone exception came in November of 1917, at the Battle of Cambrai. The British massed 400 tanks in the first concentrated armored assault. The British tank offensive at Cambrai was successful in penetrating the German lines, but due to the lack of supporting infantry and artillery, the attack eventually petered out. The Germans were able to reform their lines in front of the British advance. And this is one of the reasons that the German army did not really consider the tank to be an important weapon. The German army fielded only one type of tank during the First World War. The ponderous A-7V, a 30-ton 